All right, folks, this seems all right. How does the sound sound for people online? Um, yeah, I have to like super turn this down. Okay, if you're online, this is good. If you're in person, which is nice to see some people in person today. Uh, what we're going to do actually is um, just take like two or three minutes if you're online or in person. And what I'm going to do is get the next unit assignment set up. I forgot to do that before class started. Uh, it should just take a second. And that way we're going to be ready to go today. All right. All right, so I'm told the sound is good online, which is good. Very loud uh, thing happening there, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's see. Unit four. Okay, we're doing great. That's the wrong one. Great start to any class. A little quiet, is it? Once I get yelling. <laughs> Okay, I think we are about to start. Two minutes should be all it takes. Timing, we'll say 20. All right, I think we're ready to go. So where we're at right now, um, yeah, audio, please let me know if the audio is OK. If you can hear me OK, I can turn it up a little bit. Uh, it's kind of funny here, I'm trying to serve both online people, which is, I guess, the majority of the class, and people here. But it's very nice to see people here. So please tell me if my sound is OK, both if you're here in person or if you're here online. So yeah, I got thumbs up from in the room. Perfect. Online, thumbs up, or yeah, tell me if this is, is not good. I have my new mic. I, I've got like so many mics and things. I use this if I want to walk around. So this is, is useful for this thing. OK, so we're starting our next unit today, which is on elements of chemistry. And this bit too loud. OK, I can turn that down. Too loud. OK, I guess some sounds good. I just turned it down a touch. 
that's the thing, because sometimes I talk and then sometimes I kind of start to yell. So hopefully this, we'll get this worked out, ironed out. Um, I have a different mic that I used the last few weeks when I was online, which is obviously like different settings and I speak at a different volume. So hopefully this all is going to work out okay. Yeah, <laughs> road. Okay, perfect. So why don't we get started today? Uh, I just have to pop over here and get my pencil. And now we are all set to go. So we've done a couple of units. Um, I was looking through our previous unit that we were looking at, and what I recognized is that we um, didn't quite finish the last like two or three slides which I think is okay. I think those slides are fairly self-explanatory. I think we're ready just to jump into a new unit right now and hopefully everyone's fine with that. This is the unit four, it's called Elements of Chemistry and what this unit really is about is kind of like a, a historical view of where chemistry came from as a discipline. And kind of along the way, some of the fundamental truths or fundamental like central pillars of modern chemistry, when they were developed, why they're developed, and what they mean. Okay, great. So we're going to begin right at the very beginning with the first chemical reactions that were, I guess, we could say domesticated. And by domesticated, what I mean is that human beings were able to use these reactions, uh, control them, and use them for purposes, you know, we were able to use these for purposes of our own. And one of the very first ones of these that we could bring up is domestication of fire. And fire is certainly a chemical reaction, and I have the chemical reaction drawn out the way we would as chemists draw out a chemical reaction in terms of an equation. And what you can see here on the bottom, I mean, if you're burning wood, wood is a very complicated molecule, like molecular structure. It's not just a simple formula, but you know, if we can approximate the formula with something like that, what that means is there's a molecule that has six carbons, 10 hydrogens, and five oxygens. And it's reacting with six molecules of O2, which is oxygen that's present in air. And that's reacting, so that, you know, the arrow is showing, everything on the left of the arrow is what you start with, everything on the right of the arrow is what you're making. You're making six molecules of CO2, five water, plus heat is produced. And this is of course why we want to use fire, for the most part. We use it for other things too, like I guess getting rid of garbage and things like that, but mainly we use it for heat, for cooking, for you know, keeping ourselves warm. There is some question, I suppose, as to when we domesticated fire for the first time. Uh, we definitely by 4,000, uh, 400,000 BC were using fire. You know, these would be like earlier humans. And it could go as far back as 1.7 million years. And the question is, you know, people will find archaeological sites where there's evidence of burning and fire and so on. And it's not maybe obvious or, or maybe not super clear whether that was like a campfire that human beings used and generated or whether that might instead have been like a lightning strike and there was a fire and so there's soot and you know, so on. But you know, somewhere in that range, we were able to use this chemical reaction and control it and turn it towards our purposes. And since that time, of course, we can control many, many more chemical reactions and uh, this is just one example. This is just showing what we mean with a chemical equation. You will see lots of chemical equations in the future. Um, I, here's one thing I'm gonna say. I don't expect you at any point to memorize any equation that I write down. So don't see this and think like, okay, that, there's the first equation we gotta remember. We're not gonna approach things this way. Um, following like the beginning of civilization, we kind of marked different times of human progress in terms of our, I guess, knowledge of chemistry, you know, our level of technology as it relates to chemistry. So starting around the year 3300 B 
BC uh, began what is now known as the Bronze Age. And the Bronze Age is a, rea is, is a period of time where human beings understood how to manipulate metals in order to create bronze. And the chemical reaction for this is shown below. You take carbon, and carbon, um, you can find deposits of carbon in the form of coal, and you can create carbon from wood by making something called charcoal, and they had methods to do that at the time. If you mix this with these two minerals, copper oxide and tin oxide, uh, this chemical reaction ensues. You get carbon dioxide gas formed, as well as you get this mixture of copper and tin. So um, this mixture of copper and tin is bronze, and bronze was like an, a very useful substance for people around this time. They could use it to make pots and pans. They could use it to make weapons, you know, I guess for hunting initially, but also for warfare as well. And bronze, um, you can see this $3 Canadian coin is made of bronze. Um, it kind of has like a, almost a coppery kind of look to it. And the Bronze Age was continued until about 1200 BC. Bronze was sort of the primary metal people would have used at that time. Um, they think actually that the Bronze Age may have kind of coincided with the beginnings of like international trade because it turns out that if you look around geologically, um, deposits of copper oxide and copper deposits of uh, tin oxide don't, aren't usually found in the same locations. And so to really generate a lot of bronze, one region that would be rich in copper oxide would have to trade with a different region that's rich in tin oxide so that they could both have bronze. And they believe this may have been one of the first substances that you know, were traded in a large scale. Um, following the Bronze Age, approximately, there's a bit of overlap there, uh, began the Iron Age. And the Iron Age was when people learned how to use a new metal, iron, and uh, a required element in our diets. So if you have cookware that's made out of iron, it can actually help uh, give you small amounts of iron. So like if a little bit comes off the pan and you eat food that was cooked in the pan, that can actually help you out a little bit, give you a tiny bit of iron. And so, you know, that generally is believed to have persisted up until about uh, 400 AD. Many other early examples of chemical reactions that really helped people out. It says the chat is connected. Are we, are we people here still online? People still good? People still with me? Please let me know. I have to wait 10 seconds anytime I ask anything in the chat. Okay, we're good. Good, good. So early chemical react reactions, uh, starting around 2800 BC, people learned how to make soap. And the reaction for soap is shown on the bottom here. You start with fat, and you mix it with a chemical substance called lye, and that produces soap, and then another substance called uh, glycerin. And so this is obviously a very useful reaction, and not just because like people like to be clean, it also helps sanitize things, so it could help in the control spread of disease and things like that. Uh, so yeah, very important early chemical reaction. Leather tanning was another one. There's evidence that this was discovered around 7,000 BC in Pakistan, and tanning leather helps it become basically more durable and um, not break down so quick. I guess that means that's the same thing as durable. Um, fermentation, fermentation is a chemical reaction um, where sugar is converted into alcohol. And there's evidence that this was done to produce beer and wine, you know, 5,000, 5,400 BC in the Middle East, probably earlier than this. This is just sort of the farthest back that we have direct evidence for. So, Around 2,000 years ago, kind of around the age of the Greek philosophers and uh, so on, people kind of were curious 
what the nature of matter was. All the substance that's around us when we pick up something and you know, we see something like that. What is this actually that we are interacting with? And so, you know, people were very curious as to how matter might be composed. The prevailing opinion at the time was that there's actually four different elements, and we call these classical elements. And the four elements were fire, air, water, and earth. And so people believed at this time that all substances were some combination of these four elements. So one thing that's important about this is this idea of elements that any substance is sort of a complex mix of a, of a finite number of simpler things. And this is an idea that's persisted till today. Water, air, fire, earth. So the example I'm going to give you is you have a, a, a log, a piece of wood. That's a complex substance that's a mix of all these four things, water, air, fire, earth. And their observations were, well, if you took a piece of wood and you burned it, you see the fire come out of the wood. Um, gases come out of the wood. Some of those gases, uh, if you cool them, become water. So there's water coming out of the wood. Uh, the rest of them are air. And when you're done burning the log, you're, you get ashes. And those ashes are earth. So they were saying, well, just take those four and put them together, and you have a log. So this was a, a popular idea for a long, long time. So this is what the periodic table may have looked like back in the year zero, I guess. So this idea hasn't disappeared entirely. Um, this idea of the four elements, you still find it uh, from now, now and again. This is an ad for a spa, and you can see they kind of are theming their particular spa package along this theme of the four elements, and there's earth, air, water, fire. Um, a, a cartoon that was popular when I was a, a kid was um, Captain Planet. Anyone ever hear of Captain Planet? Anyway, Captain Planet is like, he's a superhero, but he, it's kind of like um, Power Rangers, or there's a, Power Rangers, like, they always seem to, there's like a group of, of them, and they each have their own sort of identity. And anyway, the different characters here, their identities were like earth, air, water, fire. I think there's a fifth one that was heart, which isn't one of the elements, but you know, you get the idea anyway. So we know now that these are not elements that air, water, fire, and earth, none of these are actual chemical elements as we understand them today. Um, however, if you think about those four classical substances, it kind of matches with the four phases of matter that we normally consider, where earth is kind of like a solid, um, fire is kind of like a plasma, Water is like a liquid, and air is like a gas. And if you are, you may not have be familiar with plasma. Basically, a plasma is just a gas where the particles are all charged, and fire fits that bill. And there's some other arguable uh, phases in addition to these, like um, supercritical fluids and things like that that we're not going to get into, but certainly these are the four major ones. So while they may have been wrong with the identity of the four initial elements, they at least had the phases of matter, right? So the quiz for this unit is posted. You can follow along. Which one of the following substances is not considered one of the four classic elements? And the one that's not a classic element here ah, is salt. So the idea of atomism came in the year 500 BC. That's old, that's 2,500 years ago. And the idea of atomism is this. Democritus proposed that all of matter can be divided into two types of substance. Uh, one are called atoms, and the other is called void. And what atoms are, according to Democritus, are small subunits of matter that are indivisible, that can't be broken, they're indestructible, they can't be created, they can't be destroyed, 
they live forever, they're eternal, uh, and essentially what he believed is that matter is quantized. And what quantized means is like packaged in small little units. Quanta, we'll call them. So a quantum of matter is an atom, according to Democritus. And the word atom uh, is an interesting breakdown, too. The Greek root of the word T-O-M, tom, means to cut. And A, if you put A in front of a word, it means the opposite of. So an atom literally means cannot be cut. And so that was his, his definition there. Uh, tom, you might, you, that's still you find in some words. So like if you had your tonsils out, you get a tonsillectomy. The tommy, the T-O-M-Y, the tom means to cut. Means they're cutting out your tonsils. Same thing like an appendectomy or a hysterectomy, the T-O-M is the cutting part of that process. Um, Plato came along shortly after Democritus and said, that's crap. Why would you think matter is subdivided um, into these little atoms? And what Plato is actually big into was the idea of these substances called platonic solids. And the platonic solid is named after Plato. It's like his solids. And what these are are three-dimensional shapes where all of the faces of the shapes are regular polygons. So an example is a cube. You know, a cube has squares on all faces. Um, other example is a tetrahedron. That's where you have equilateral triangles on all the faces. You can have something called an octahedron, an icosahedron. And Plato thought that these were special and important and somehow fundamental to how our universe is structured. He thought like the symmetry was beautiful and that he ultimately believed the world is beautiful and so there must be some relationship here. And what he did is he actually connected these four classic elements with these four shapes and he said the tetrahedron like here kind of is like fire because it's got sharp corners you know, if it poked into you, it would hurt, just like fire hurts if you stuck your hand in. Um, he said, Earth was like a cube, where a cube is like solid, won't roll, stays in one place. He said, that's kind of like a solid. Um, an icosahedron, he thought, was like water, because it kind of is like ball-shaped, and it can roll. So if you had like a, you know, a container of balls, and you rolled it back and forth, it's kind of like a liquid. Uh, octahedron, he decided, was air. Um, so, you know, even though some of these Greek philosophers had some ideas which turned out to be ultimately correct, um, they were lacking one important part. And what that was is experimental evidence. And the idea that you should use physical evidence and observation to support philosophical claims didn't come actually until much later. Aristotle came after Plato. He rejected atomism altogether. He said, you can infinitely subdivide uh, matter, and you can always just cut it in half again and again and again, making it infinitely small. It, you don't end up hitting some fundamental small unit that you can't cut anymore, or you can't divide it any further. So I have this example of a pie, where you can cut a piece of pie in half, cut a piece of pie in half, and the question becomes, at what point do you cut a piece of pie in half where it no longer has the properties of a piece of pie? And those properties would be things like flavor, you know, taste, and things like that. Um, and we know that, that's, that eventually you'll get down to the atomic level, and you can't cut anymore without breaking molecules, so destroying the matter itself. Uh, so what happened over the next, say, thousand years? was, or maybe 1,500 years, was the rise of alchemy. And alchemy is sort of like a pre-scientific version of chemistry. And um, alchemy was practiced by a lot of people in a lot of different places. And it actually has really wormed its way into our popular culture in a couple of different ways. So alchemists, uh, I mean, this is a very big generalization here, but alchemists were primarily interested in two different things. 
The first thing was the conversion of so-called base metals. And these were common metals that people had access to lots of, things like lead, maybe bronze, maybe iron, and things like that. And try, they were trying to figure out how you might be able to convert these into gold. And you might look at that and say, well, there's an obvious economic reason why you'd want to do that. Gold is valuable, you used to make jewelry, you could potentially make a lot of money with gold and so on. But really that wasn't what drove the alchemists. Alchemists recognized that gold had a property that was unusual. And that property was that gold was immortal. In other words, you can take gold and just leave it out for forever, really, and it doesn't oxidize, it doesn't rust, it doesn't tarnish, where every other metal they knew of did gradually decompose. This is one of the reasons why gold has always been valued for things like jewelry and things like coinage, and why now we value it for things like contacts in electronics, because it doesn't rust, it doesn't build up oxide layers, it doesn't lose its properties over time, like almost every other metal does. So they were interested in gold because they, 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 it's not like they just wanted a whole bunch of gold, which th maybe they did too, but what they wanted to do fundamentally was figure out how to take something that's perishable and turn it into something that's not perishable. And they figured if they could solve this with gold, they could solve it with something else. So what they were ex hoping is to find something that has been called the philosopher's stone. And the philosopher's stone is not a literal rock, like a lit literal stone, or it's not necessarily a literal stone. What it is is some catalyst or substance or something physical that they could use to turn water into something called the elixir of life. And the elixir of life was something that if you drank it as a human, you know, uh, it would give you immortality. It would prevent you from decaying. Because they could see something like iron gradually rusting if left outside as being similar to our human bodies where, you know, as you age, you slowly break down, you slowly decay, eventually you kind of lose function, and then eventually you die. Ultimately, what the alchemists wanted to do was not die. So they figured if they could make gold last longer, they could make themselves last longer by extending the same process. So as you can see in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, uh, I think in the US it's called the Sorcerer's Stone. Might be wrong, I don't know. There must be a Harry Potter fan that can confirm that or deny that. Um, but they're, they're borrowing ideas, and it's not just this. Harry Potter is full of borrowed concepts from alchemy. So, for example, and not just Harry Potter, almost every kind of cartoon uh, um, uh, portrayal of magic, or magicians, or witches, or warlocks, you know, wizards, all these things come from alchemy. Because what they would often do is, um, take different substances and mix them together in a big pot or cauldron, like you see with witches, and the substances they were putting in, you know, like Eye of Newt, it's like potions class in, in Harry Potter. They would use a stick to stir things up, and the stir stick became the magic wand. And what they would also often do, um, and this was very, you know, as I say, pre-scientific, they would often believe that incantations were important for the chemical processes they were trying to do. So they would have this ritualistic element to the, what they were trying to do. So what they would do, they'd take a pot, throw in water, throw in a bunch of random things, and, and then they, they believed that the mixture was important, but also what was important was, you know, saying the correct words, like the magic words, and, and maybe like, moving your stir stick in a certain way, maybe like chanting, maybe walking around the cauldron in a certain way. They thought that was important and that if you didn't do that correctly, the reaction could fail. They didn't understand why reactions happened or wouldn't happen, so they kind of built up this sort of mystical element to it and it wasn't just, uh, you know, it wasn't just that. 
Uh, one interesting story here involves um, the discovery of one of the actual elements, which is phosphorus, and it came from an alchemist named Hennig Brand. And what he was trying to do, of course, the same as the rest of them, find a way to make people live forever, find the essence of life, find the philosopher stone, and convert base metals to gold. And he made this important observation, that gold is kind of yellowish in color. And that practically every other metal is like silvery in color. There's a few like bronze isn't and like copper isn't. But gold was kind of yellowish and all the other metals weren't. So he, he was thinking, whatever is making gold immortal, perhaps it's also responsible for the color gold. And then he had another brainwave next time he went to the bathroom and he was peeing and he was like, oh my God, this pee is the same color as gold. So it's like as a young person, you're full of like immortality, but every time you pee, you lose some of this yellow substance, which means you lose some of your life, and eventually you pee it all out, and then you get old and die. So this is what his hypothesis was, is that the yellow substance in urine is the same yellow substance in gold that is responsible for immortality. So he did this experiment. He went and he collected a lot of urine. Like he collected a, like, like 100 liters. And I don't know how he did it, if he had volunteers, or if he had farm animals or how he did it. But he collected all this urine and then he decided to like boil it down, like boil the water off and figure out what substance was left behind when you do that. And so he boiled all the water down. Eventually he got to like a paste, like a thick paste of like urine salts. And he kept heating it and he kept heating it. He drove all the water off. And then what he found is after all the water was gone, it started to develop this like waxy white substance inside his like boiling container. And so he took tongs, he reached in to the top and he picked out this piece of waxy white material and he held it up. And as soon as he held it up in the air, it burst into a bright white light and then disappeared. So imagine that happened to you. You had this hypothesis that the essence of immortality, the essence of life, was somehow being drained out of us in our urine, you collected this pure white substance and you lifted it up and it burst into light. He thought he discovered the essence of immortality and whatever that substance was, was the life force. He like literally held a piece of life force in his hands. It turns out that's not what it was. Uh, what he actually produced was a chemical, a pure element called white phosphorus. And white phosphorus is formed when you take phosphates, three minus, which is present in urine, and you mix it with organic materials, so carbon-based compounds like CX, H, N, O, you know, like urea, uric acids, other things that could be in the urine. You mix them together and they make just P. It's technically P4 is, this, is the, uh, the formula. And this substance, if you bring it up into air, reacts with the air to make P2O3. Maybe it's P2O6. But in, in doing this, it's a very rapid reaction. It produces a lot of light. And um, so that's actually what he had physically done. Something very important nonetheless, isolated phosphorus for the first time. However, it wasn't exactly what he thought. So one thing that the alchemists did do for us, which has been very important, is they discovered a lot of methods of purifying chemicals. Because they believed, you know, if you had mixed mixtures of things, you needed to use pure chemicals to really understand what was happening uh, chemically and to get good reactions. And so they came up with methods like distillation. This is from an old um, alchemist text where they show, you know, you can basically boil a substance. So if you have something like, say, salt water in here, you could boil the water, turn it into a gas, cool the gas down in a condenser, and have pure water drip out the other side. So they could purify liquids this way. 
Um, this is now used in distillation of alcohol. So this is like a still, I guess this is like a moonshine still somebody built. But the idea is the same. You can heat it on one side, the gas goes up, it gets cooled, and it can be collected somewhere else. Um, when you do fermentation of something like wine or beer or ferment grains, anything like that, potatoes, anything with starch or sugar, you can ferment. Molasses is what you use if you want to make rum. Um, the fermentation can only get you up to about like 13 or 14 percent alcohol. To get higher than that, you need to do distillation. You need to purify, concentrate the actual alcohol. Um, another method that they figured out was recrystallization. And this is a way of purifying salts and solids. So we still use those methods today. So what's an example of an important and lasting discovery made by the alchemists? And the example that we're looking at here is, you know, I wish, right? Elixir of life was this one. Distillation and recrystallization. Purification methods. They were definitely looking for elixir of life uh, and the philosopher's stone. Never found it. So you could become an alchemist and still look. Why not? Well, become a chemist, chemist first. Uh, the death of alchemy and the rise of chemistry happened in the 1600s. And many people mark that transition to actual chemistry uh, with the publication of this book called The Skeptical Chemist in 1661 by Robert Boyle, British scientist. And he basically said that, you know, the alchemists have a couple of ideas that are good, you know, around purification and whatever, but he said a lot of their, like, mystical parts of this and the spells and the magic words and all these sort of elements to it, he said, is, is basically garbage. He said, we need to be a little more systematic and we need to be more thoughtful, you know. We need to keep better records and we need to basically apply the sort of new ideas of science to the study of changes of matter. He proposed, though, that matter is composed of simpler substances he called elements. Going back to the original idea of the Greek philosophers, they believed there was elements, they just believed there was four of them, and all four that they believed existed are not real elements as we know today. Uh, he calls elements primitive and simple, perfectly unmingled, which means they're not mixed with anything else. They're perfectly unmingled, which means they're pure. Um, they're not being made up out of anything else or each other. They're the ingredients of what we call perfectly mixed bodies. Basically, they're compounded into all other substances that we, uh, we know of. So, you know, like a piece of wood, again, it is made out of simpler substances. Those substances just are not water, fire, earth, and air. Okay. Um, skipping ahead, 100 years to Lavoisier, who was a French chemist in Paris. Uh, Lavoisier demonstrated a very important law called the Law of Conservation of Mass. And what the Law of Conservation of Mass states is that when you do a chemical reaction, when there's change from reactants to products, the mass doesn't change. Whatever you had in mass before is the same as the mass you have after. And this was a revolutionary idea at the time because it's against common sense. Because if you took a candle and you have a big tall candle and you lit it on fire and it burns down, burns down, burns down to a little nub, everybody would look at that and say, yeah, that camera, the camera, I was looking at the camera. Here we go. I'll look at the camera this way. Uh, if you burn that candle down to a little nub, what that means is that little nub obviously weighs less than it did before, so people would assume mass was lost in that process. What they didn't account for, though, was the fact that, you know, that little uh, candle produced a whole bunch of gases, and that if you could collect all of those gases, 
no mass was lost in that process. So the way you could actually demonstrate this is if you look at the slides that you see here where we have kind of a balloon and I'm going to pop back for the people online because that view of the screen is kind of crappy. Uh, this is a, like a, a classic reaction that you may have done as a kid where you mix vinegar and baking soda together and they react, they fizz, they produce a gas which is carbon dioxide and in this example what it does is it fills up the balloon and you see the balloon inflate. If you do this on a scale, this whole reaction, the mass never changes at any point along this if you have the balloon there to prevent the gases from escaping. So you see the gas stays the same the whole way through and no mass is lost in this process. All right. We're going to take a, a detour. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about a study that was done just a couple of years ago um, where people were interested in what professionals believed, uh, and these are professionals in the weight loss industry. In particular, dietitians, they were looking at uh, physicians, medical doctors, they were looking at personal trainers who help people lose weight through fitness, exercise, and they asked them all this question. When people lose weight, if they lose fat, you know, let's say they drop 10 kilograms of fat, be 22 pounds, uh, where does all that fat go? What happens to it? And these are the choices they could, they could pick. It is lost as energy or heat. It becomes muscle. It is excreted in sweat or urine. It is excreted in feces. It's converted to carbon dioxide and exhaled something else or they have no idea. So I just want to leave this slide up for one second. I want you to answer this question yourself. What do you think happens to fat when you lose 20 pounds due to some combination of diet and exercise? Well, I'll show you what the professionals in this industry believed happened. And you see the three types, family doctors, dietitians, personal trainers. Um, the overwhelmingly popular opinion was that it gets converted into energy and heat through exercise. And over 50% of all groups, personal trainers uh, surprisingly were the lowest fraction at 50%, fam doctors and dietitians up there closer to 75%. Um, a sizable fraction said other some said feces, very few said sweat or urine, uh, some says it becomes muscle. Um, the correct answer is this one. By far the least popular choice. None of the family doctors chose that. None of the personal trainers chose that. The dietitians were the best of the group. Some percentage of them, maybe around 5%, picked it. This one, doesn't make sense in light of Lavoisier's discovery. He said that when you do a chemical reaction, mass can't just disappear. That the mass you have at the beginning has to equal the mass at the end. So if our body lose ma loses mass, that mass has to appear somewhere else. And it appears in the form of carbon dioxide and water that we exhale, okay? Our bodies use sugars, they take the carbon, they combine it with oxygen, and you breathe out. Every time you breathe in a molecule of O2, you breathe out a molecule of CO2. So the breathing process is carrying carbon out of your body, which we replenish with food. If you don't get enough food, it will pull fat molecules out of your body and use those as a source of carbon to get the carbon out of your body. So you can't just convert it into energy because energy has no mass. You can't convert fat into energy. Energy is certainly also produced if you go for a run or something like that, but it doesn't account for the loss in mass. So Lavoisier extended this idea of elements that were brought up by Robert Boyle 100 years earlier, and he actually wrote in, in 1789 uh, what's believed to be the first chemistry textbook. He called the book Elements, and what he did is he listed 
really what the extent of chemical knowledge was at the time, which was actually like fairly sparse. And he listed out all known elements. And all these ones that are written out here in black were the elements that were known to exist in 1789. I've put them on a modern periodic table. I put them where they belong on the current modern periodic table, which was not developed then. It was developed about 100 years later after this. But it gives you an idea, every one of those blanks is an element that has yet to be discovered. In fact, there's the, this actually extends out here. There's more elements out here that have been discovered. And not only that, there's also two more rows beneath this with even more elements that have yet to be discovered. So a small fraction of elements were actually known at the time. Um, Paul Lavoisier uh, died, I think maybe that same year or maybe the year later. He was in France during a pretty uh, busy time. Anybody know what was going on in France around 1789? Yeah, that was a French Revolution. Uh, during the French Revolution, academics were treated with suspicion. And not only that, um, he worked in a university that had foreigners also working in the university, and he made the big mistake big mistake for himself personally of standing up for one of his foreign, like not French born uh, co-workers. And that act of, just looking at my picture here, it's like I'm all blue under here because of the iPad screen, but anyway, a little bit weird. Um, yeah, so he got um, dragged out, he was sentenced to death, and he was executed by guillotine. And um, there's a famous quote, I don't, forget even who said it, but it was like, it took 100 years for France to produce a head that intelligent, and it took them like 10 minutes to cut that head off, you know? So, apparently like three weeks later, the, uh, they sent an apology to his wife for killing him, and they like sent her a box with his crap, you know, in it, whatever from his office and stuff, but... Too little, too late, he was dead. But his impact is important. His impact persisted. All right. So the next guy I'm gonna talk about is Humphrey Davy. He came 1778, so he overlapped a little bit in time with Lavoisier. As a teenager, you know, by the time he was 18, he had gotten a copy of Lavoisier's book, Elements of Chemistry. And he had read it cover to cover several times and really absorbed kind of, basically he brought himself up to the state of the art knowledge of chemistry at the time. Not just chemistry, he was interested in a lot of different science. And uh, in particular, he was interested in electricity and the work of people like Volta, who, was, who were determining how electricity worked, which was still a very new field at the time. Um, by age 20, he started writing public, uh, scientific publications. He clarified the nature of energy at age 20. By age 21, he developed a chemical method to produce a pure new gas, N2O. And this gas is um, nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is, another name for this is laughing gas. And what he would do is he would breathe this in and he would get high and he would write stuff when he got high. He'd have these parties. He built this chamber where you could like get inside the chamber and then he'd like fill it with this gas and then you'd, you know, basically just be breathing it in uh, and he would have like people over and have fun with that kind of stuff. Um, he actually proposed that it would be useful in medicine to get someone high before you decided to attempt surgery on them, um, which we actually still use that now. You may have been to a dentist or something like that and been given laughing gas. Uh, so it was, you know, it had its, a very valuable use as a sedative. Um, although I think it took people like 100 years before it started to be used in medicine. Um, but in age 22, he was interested in batteries, the work of Volta, and he theorized that the electricity produced by a battery was the result of a chemical reaction and that chemical reactions and electricity were somehow 
uh, connected or were somehow manifestations of the same thing. So what he did is he built this huge battery. And he used um, copper and tin, and he used bits of like cardboard that were soaked in salt water. And you can see a picture of his battery. It's on this table. You know how if you took a battery, like a, like a double A battery, and you put another one and you touch the ends, you can actually have like two batteries in parallel. And you could have three, and you can have four, and so on. And every time you add another battery, it increases the voltage by like one and a half volts. So if you took a nine volt battery, those kind of like squarish ones, and you cut it open, what it actually is is six one and a half volt batteries inside, uh, all connected end to end with wires. And if you add the six one and a halfs together, you get nine. Um, basically what this is, is like hundreds of individual batteries back to back, all connected together. And he could get a really pretty good voltage by having two wires coming off opposite ends of this table-sized battery. And what he could do is if he kind of touched the two ends of the battery together, they would spark, you know? So he, you know, you, you could see the electricity with your eyes traveling in this situation. Um, one of the first things he did actually was take dead organisms, like a dead frog, and he would zap it with the ends of his huge battery. And he'd watch like the muscles twitch and flip and he could see the frog's, you know, muscles kick back and forth, which he was fascinated by because he was making like limbs of a dead organism seem as if they're alive, basically come back to life. So he also believed that there's something fundamental about life and living and the way our muscles work and our bodies operate that's connected to the chemistry and connected to the electricity. Um, a simpler thing he did in, the mid uh, in his mid-20s is he took the two leads from his battery and just stuck it in a container of water. And what he noticed is at each electrode, gas started to bubble off out of the water, and he was able to collect the gas. And the experiment looks sort of like this. You could take a battery, and you could take the two leads, stick them in water, and if you put them over like an inverted tube, you can collect the two gases, and what he noticed was that the two gases were different, that one of them was oxygen and the other one was hydrogen. And he noticed they were formed in like a two to one ratio. So he predicted at that time that water must be made up of these two elements, oxygen and hydrogen, and they must be present in water in a two to one ratio. So pretty simple experiment. Stuck electrodes in water, decomposed it into its elements, and got basically the, the formula for water that we now know today is H2O. So that was pretty cool. He continued to do this. He would stick it in all sorts of things. Uh, he would take like, me, like salts, like potassium chloride and things like this, and he would um, melt them and stick the electrodes in, and he was finding that he could decompose using this battery all sorts of different substances. He discovered potassium, sodium metal, and proposed them as new elements by the time he was 29. When he was 30, he isolated calcium, magnesium, strontium, barium, boron, all of these for the first time. Um, by the time he was age 32, he also discovered chlorine, and then he started to theorize how these materials must look like before they're decomposed, which we're going to talk about later. 34, he was knighted. He was hugely influential. Um, he was the first scientist to be knighted in the UK since Newton. And also in that year, when he turned 34, he got married. And he had a different idea of what a honeymoon was for than I think most people think. Uh, so with him, he brought following, air pump, electrical machine, his battery, a blowpipe apparatus, bellows and forge. This is so he could like melt glass and make glassware and containers. Uh, mercurial and water gas apparatus. That's like a system for measuring air pressure. Um, cups and basins of platinum and glass, the common reagents of chemistry. 
and his research assistant, Michael Faraday. And I guess he took his wife along, too. And so he, he viewed his honeymoon not as like a romantic getaway to spend time with his wife. He viewed it as like a chance to go travel and meet with other scientists. So he did. First stop was Paris. He met with uh, two scientists, Ampere and Gay-Lussac, who were working on this problem. They discovered this substance they were able to isolate from seaweed. So he worked with them and helped them identify it as another new element, iodine. And he predicted there must be another element, which we now know is bromine, and he predicted its properties at the time. So pretty interesting. If we go back to Lavoisier's periodic table that was in black, all the elements in black were the one Lavoisier's figured out. All the blue ones are the ones that Davy added. So just single-handedly, he just, you know, filled in a big chunk of the periodic table that was missing. One thing about Davy, which I think makes him hold sort of a special place in history, is that in addition to being like a brilliant scientist who discovered all these new elements, um, he was also like a big showman. And what he would do is he would have these huge public lectures in, in um, London very frequently where he would invite a bunch of people to come and he would do all these demonstrations. So one thing he would do is he'd get a dead frog, he would get his battery and he would zap the frog and the legs would start kicking. Or another thing he might do is stick it in water, uh, isolate, the hydrogen and then light it on fire, or these sorts of things. He had all these demos. And at this time, like the general public was fascinated by this. They would fill the halls and it was like sold out every single time he would do this. Um, Mary Shelley, who was a famous author, attended one of his, I think maybe his first public lecture and watched him zap the frog and watched the legs kick and flinch and so on. And she says this, right, right after seeing it. A new influence has been discovered, which has enabled man to produce from combinations of dead matter effects which were formerly occasioned only by animal organs. Right? So that's her describing the frog legs kicking. Does anyone know what Mary Shelley is famous for writing? Frankenstein, Frankenstein exactly. So she wrote Frankenstein, and you can imagine where she may have gotten the original idea for that idea. Where Frankenstein, actually Frankenstein was the scientist, not the monster. The scientist goes out, he gathers dead bodies, or dead organisms, just like Davy went out and got dead frogs. Um, stitches them together, takes this giant battery, zaps the whole thing, and it comes to life. Which is exactly what Davy had done for real with the frog, although the frog, it was just activating, you know, dead muscles. It wasn't bringing the frog to life, of course. All right, some more questions. If you go on a diet, lose 10 pounds of fat, what happens to the carbon atoms that are lost? Um, we talked about this. Correct answer is C, in this instance, converted to CO2 and exhaled. All right, Davy does know how to have a good time, for those not <laughs> reading the, the online chat. Um, which, which chemist postulated the law of conservation of mass and wrote the first chemistry textbook called Elements, but was killed by guillotine in the French Revolution? That was Lavoisier. You could have guessed that maybe even just from the name, French. French Revolution. I guess Marie Curie, she's kind of French. Like, she's from Poland, but she did her work in France. Uh, John Dalton came along after Davy, um, also a very influential chemist. He was not nearly as like gregarious and outwardly showy, but, you know, still, um, Important, I guess, made some important contributions. And he wrote 
what is now really considered to be modern atomic theory. <clears throat> so his theory had the following postulates. First, elements are composed of atoms. In other words, if you take a pure element like silver, like gold, like lead, like oxygen, and you broke it down, eventually you'll hit individual subunits that we call atoms. The reasons they believed atoms existed at the time were because what they were finding is chemicals always seemed to have certain ratios that were fixed of elements in compounds. So sodium and chloride, for example, they always found the same ratio of sodium and chlorine no matter where the substance came from. And if it was just some mixture and not based on individual atoms, you might expect there to be kind of any random mix of sodium and chlorine as opposed to the one-to-one -one mix. Two, all atoms of a given element are identical. Three, atoms of different elements are different and distinguished by their atomic weights. Four, atoms can combine in various ratios to make compounds. And five, atoms cannot be created or destroyed. A chemical reaction merely changes their grouping. So this is our modern theory. We believe all these things Although every one of these, except for the first one, has exceptions. So two, all atoms of a given element are identical. That's not exactly true. There's such a thing called isotopes, where you can have different variations of atoms in the same element. Um, certain elements have very similar weights and are difficult to distinguish that way. Um, atoms can combine in various ratios. There's such thing as compounds that don't have fixed whole number ratios, and atoms cannot be created or destroyed. We know there's nuclear reactions that can create and destroy elements, atoms. But in ordinary garden variety, run-of-the-mill chemical reactions, these are all generally true. You came up to with the, this kind of like symbology where all these different elements that were known and understood at the time were given these symbols, and these symbols he could, you know, each element had a different symbol, and you could draw like a compound by putting these symbols together. And, you know, he started off the represent, using symbols to represent chemicals. Um, these were what they looked like. Some of these are, are kind of cool, like, I don't know, like silver is just an S. I don't know, some of these kind of look neat. Azote is uh, nitrogen. Azote means without life. Because if you breathe nitrogen, you can't live. It's like air with oxygen removed. But ultimately, they never caught on. Another chemist, Johns Jacob Berzelius, came along after. He proposed a simpler notation. He said, why don't we just like use the first letter of the element, and that's the symbol. So hydrogen becomes H, oxygen becomes O. And for some elements, you need two letters because you know, there's many elements that start with M. What is there? There's mang magnesium, manganese. I don't know. I can't think of any more right now, but there's more. Uh, Moscovium. Did you ever hear of that one? It's one of the most recent elements to be named. He proposed uh, for compounds that you put H, O, and then you put superscripts to indicate the ratios of one type of element to another type. So water, he proposed to be H2O with the two as a superscript. And that's actually what we use today, except we use it as a subscript instead of a superscript, so small change, but essentially the same idea. He also spent a lot of time trying to get accurate masses of different elements, pure elements. So an atom of silver will weigh this. An atom of carbon will weigh that. And he's trying to like really tabulate what all these numbers were. He also helped discover a few more elements. These ones in red, he added to the mix. Lithium, vanadium, silicon, and selenium. So, you know, he had a number of different contributions to our understanding of chemistry at the time. All right, another question. Humphrey Davy. 
isolated many new elements by putting what into containers of molten salts and water. He put frog legs in, terminals of a large battery, carbon powder, or his finger. We know that one. This is a picture of him, by the way. Artist rendering, of course. He has this bag of laughing gas that he's created. Uh, she looks pretty happy and high as a result. Uh, the other one, she kind of looks like, I don't know, she doesn't look into it. So I don't know how well developed the concept of consent was in those days, but uh, he looks pretty evil in this picture, to me at least. Berzelius discovered some new elements and obtained more accurate weights. Foe's chemical notation, what does the subscript to indicate in the formula for water? Two hydrogen atoms are required to equal the mass of one oxygen. Uh, the ratio of elements in water is two parts oxygen to one part hydrogen. One hydrogen atom makes two bonds to an oxygen atom. The ratio of elements in water is two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen. <laughs> the same answer is here twice. Look at that. The answer is B and D. Uh, let me double check that question when I get back to my office. I'll make sure no matter which one you pick, you get the right answer. Oh, you are right, they're not. Thank you, yeah, these aren't the same. Two parts oxygen to one part hydrogen or two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen. Thank you. The answer is D, H2O. All right. So we're back to our periodic table. One thing that we'd actually know, uh, you know, the way these are arranged in the modern periodic table is not random. It makes sense, you know, there's a logic behind it all. And from a very early time, going back to Davy, people recognized um, similarities in how different elements would behave. They'd have similar kinds of reactions, form similar kinds of compounds, and people thought that they were somehow, therefore, related. They were part of families, you know, and there were some, you know, people were, were, there was hints that there was an overriding kind of logic to what elements, why they existed, why they did what they did, and, you know, how many elements there are. They had no idea what that underlying logic was. They were just hints of it. And Maybe it's not that surprising since still like half the periodic table is empty. It was hard to draw a lot of conclusions with incomplete information. But one thing that we know, if you look at this row on the periodic table, um, lithium, sodium, potassium, and going below, rubidium, cesium, uh, francium, they have very similar types of chemical reactivity. So if you took a piece of lithium and you dropped it in water, you're going to see something like this. It'll fizzle in the water. It reacts with the water to make hydrogen gas. Um, you can get lithium if you take a lithium, um, certain types of lithium batteries. And you can find there's a piece of lithium in there. You can actually stick in water and it'll do this. If you do the same thing with sodium, sodium does the same thing. You drop it in water, it reacts with the water, makes hydrogen gas. It actually produces enough heat to ignite the hydrogen gas, so you get fire, and you get sodium ions, or Na plus ions in the water. Potassium, it does the same thing. It's even more fierce than the other ones. Lithium is sort of like not that spectacular. Sodium will catch on fire. Potassium, you can see it's like sputtering and spitting and gives off kind of a purplish flame. And rubidium, it just, yeah, it reacts even more rapidly. Just goes in, bang, and breaks your flask. I don't have one for cesium. Francium is one of the rarest elements on Earth. It's radioactive. I think they say if you gathered up all the francium on the planet and put it together, you have like one gram. It's like almost none of it on Earth. All right, so people were interested in you know, this underlying logic about why certain elements seem related in terms of the reactions they do. And there's many attempts 
people trying to put this information together. Uh, this guy, Doberreiner, in 1850, um, recognized that there's families of elements that react similarly, like lithium, sodium, potassium, where if you took the mass of the first one in the series and the second one in the series and took the average, it ends up being the mass of the middle one in the series. And this was true for multiple different series. You know, it's not always perfect. Like this one, the middle one is 75, and the average is 76.5. But you get the idea. And he was saying there's some relationship then between elements that are similar in reactivity and in the same family and their masses. And he came up with these triads, these groups of three. Uh, Newland, John Newland, um, saw what he considered to be um, a relationship between the chemical elements and music. Where if you have a musical scale, you know, like if you are, say, here on the scale, that's a C. And if you go up a note, you go to D, E, F, G, and then, you know, it goes back, then it goes back to A. But what he noticed is if you kind of go up one note at a time, um, when you're playing on a musical scale, after you get past the eighth note, you go back to the beginning of the scale again. You're in a new octave, but you're in the same scale. So the scale repeats over and over and over again, and you have like a C, middle C, next C, and, and, and there's many Cs on a piano, for example. And so what he was saying is those are related to each other, those being the same family, and if you look at the chemical elements, hydrogen and then lithium, you can kind of go through the scale, and when the scale repeats itself, you get sodium. When it repeats itself again, you get to potassium. And it actually works very well, this, uh, the scale of eight elements, until you get somewhere around sodium. Then it gets kind of screwy, kind of breaks down. And so he's like, maybe there was something. Like, it works so super nice for the early elements. And how beautiful would it be if, like, our understanding of chemistry and, and elements and the substances of matter, like the fundamental way the universe is built, has like reflections in how the musical scale and the tones and how we appreciate sound. Like if those matched up, think how nice that would, would seem. Uh, there is something to do with octaves. We call them octets in chemistry, which we'll come back to at a different time. By the way, notice there's also some missing. They still didn't know all the elements then. Helium fits in between hydrogen and lithium. So they didn't quite have all the elements yet at that time. Uh, here's another one. Naquette published a paper where he identified families and put each type of similar element into these families. Um, Finally, Mendeleev was the one that really cracked this. Mendeleev was a Russian scientist, and he organized all the known elements according to their masses, as they were known to be at the time, and based on their chemistry. And he started with this sort of cluster, where he was like, well, there's chlorine, potassium, and calcium form an increasing series in mass. And if you go down, chlorine, bromine, iodine are in a family, similar reactivity. Uh, potassium, rubidium, cesium, calcium, strontium, barium. And you can kind of see that like, it's increasing, and then you kind of go to the next row, it's increasing again and increasing again. And he was able to fit all of the known elements into this sort of a grid kind of a pattern, which is what we use now. His table was, was you know, brilliant, I would say, for two reasons. Bold reasons, but one of them was that a whole bunch of elements were still not yet discovered. So what he did is he, he recognized the spaces on his periodic table where there should be undiscovered elements, and he just left gaps. He said, you know, we don't know what's here. There's another element to be discovered which is going to fill in that space. And not only that, using his periodic table, he was able to predict the unknown elements and what their properties would be. Because, well, this blank here, it's in this family, it needs to have a mass around here, and it needs to have a reactivity like this, and a density like this, and so on and so on. 
The other thing he did is he changed atomic weights that were already published if they didn't fit in his table. It's like, no, nope, they measured that wrong. It's actually this. And it turns out um, he was actually right in many of these cases, that many of these ones that he renamed actually should have been renamed. So nobody really paid much attention to his periodic table until a few years later when a new element was discovered and Mendeleev had called it Ica aluminum. It was one of the um, elements that was in a blank underneath aluminum, which is why they called it Ica aluminum. Um, it's now known as gallium. It's got a mass of 69.72. He predicted it would have a mass of 68. He predicted it would have a density of 5.9 grams per mil, and that's exactly its density. And he predicted its chemical reactivity, which is very close to the way gallium actually reacts. So people recognize right away his periodic table has predictive power, right? There's, he cracked it. He somehow arranged all the elements and everything we know, predicted the stuff we don't know, and fixed things that we thought we knew, but we had measured incorrectly. So he says this, before the promulgation of this law, chemical elements were mere fragmentary, fragmentary incidental facts in nature. There was no reason to expect the discovery of new elements. After this table, there was a whole bunch of blanks where he could lead people and say, one here, one there, one there, and one there. That's where he got to, and I think this is where I'm going to call it quits, okay? We're about an hour and 20 minutes in. I don't really feel like I can kind of start the next piece without um, going over time, and I don't want to keep you guys too late. Thank you all who decided to come in person. Thank you all who are here online. Hopefully the online experience isn't significantly worse than it was in the past. Um, if you have any suggestions for me, please let me know.